I'm sure you've all heard the old saying, it got so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Well, as I entered Donnie's bar, it didn't quite reach that level of silence, but it came pretty close. The usual lively crowd fell into a hush, transitioning from a boisterous party atmosphere to something akin to the quietude of a church service. The cause of this sudden drop in noise was seated in a secluded booth at the back of the bar, accompanied by another man, perhaps I should say her new man. The patrons watched in anticipation, their murmurs barely audible, as they awaited the inevitable confrontation between myself and her. My name is Chris Jackson, and they were all eager to see how I would react. The her in question is Gloria Price, who until two weeks ago was my fiancée. The guy she was with, Frank or whatever his name is, didn't really matter, he was just a pawn in her game to get under my skin. I made my way to the bar, where Donnie promptly slid a glass containing three fingers of Jack Daniels down the counter to me. He knows my drink of choice because I've been a loyal customer for many years, particularly in these past couple of weeks. Donnie's bar was my sanctuary, a place I'd frequented at least once a week after work for several years. But over the last two weeks, I found myself here every night, attempting to drown my sorrows in Jack Daniels. I'm aware that alcohol doesn't solve problems, they're still there when you wake up the next day or sober up. However, alcohol has a way of temporarily numbing the pain and helping you forget. And I needed that oblivion, if only for a brief respite, from the incessant questions twirling in my mind. Why did Gloria betray me? What did I do to deserve this? The questions looped endlessly in my head, offering no solace or answers. I quickly polished off the remaining half of my drink, then leaned against the bar, fixating on the mirror behind it. Through its reflection, I had a clear line of sight to the back booth where Gloria and her companion sat. Our eyes met briefly in the mirror, confirming that she was indeed watching me. I grudgingly admitted that Gloria looked stunning. It was evident she had put extra effort into her appearance, likely with the sole purpose of getting a rise out of me. Her choice of attire, a dark green skirt that hugged her curves and ended just above her knees, accentuated her long legs, which seemed to go on for days. Topping off her ensemble was some sort of frilly top that left little to the imagination, teasing with a hint of cleavage. The light green hue of her outfit complemented her fiery auburn hair, striking blue eyes and the sprinkling of freckles across her nose and cheeks. I knew all too well from intimate encounters that those freckles extended to other, more intimate areas of her body. Combined with her classically beautiful features, Gloria was the embodiment of desire, a walking fantasy. As she moved gracefully through the room, she effortlessly commanded the attention of both men and women alike. Her appearance tonight served as yet another painful reminder of what I had lost. With a determined gulp, I drained the last of my Jack Daniels, pushed away from the bar, and made my way toward Gloria and her companion. Chris, Donnie's voice carried a note of concern. I know Donnie, I'm just going to talk to her, that's all. I reassured him, trying to sound calm despite the turmoil brewing inside. Timon, Chris, I don't want my place smashed up, he pleaded, his worry evident. It's okay, Donnie, I'm just gonna talk. I'll walk away before any trouble starts. Just like last time, I promised, hoping to ease his fears. The memory of last week flashed through my mind when Gloria had come looking for me and I had angrily demanded she stay away from me and from Donnie's bar. I had feared losing control and without waiting for her response, I stormed out. But this time, I wasn't going to leave. As I approached their table, my agitation was palpable and the guy seated with Gloria began to rise. I wouldn't want to be sitting down facing an enraged version of myself either. At 6 feet 4 inches and around 230 pounds of muscle, I was an imposing figure, built from years of hard work on construction sites rather than gym workouts. My steely gray eyes, usually calm, now bore into him with laser-like intensity, fueled by anger. Sit down, I commanded as I reached their booth. He complied, but his smirk only fueled my fury. Hello, Gloria. I see you've brought the asshole with you this time. I addressed her coldly. The guide attempted to interject, but I silenced him with a raised hand, his smirk still firmly in place. I addressed Frank directly, 
hoping to appeal to some sense of reason. Friend, this is strictly between Gloria and me. Please just stay out of it, all right? I doubted Mr. Macho would heed my request, but I hope to have my say without any unnecessary trouble. Turning back to Gloria, I couldn't contain my frustration. Look, Gloria, I made myself clear last week. I told you to stay away from me and Donnie's. I don't want to see you, especially not with your lover. Gloria's defiance was evident in her reply. This is a public bar, Chris. I can come here if I want to. I felt a surge of anger at her audacity. Isn't it enough that you screwed me over right before our wedding? Now you want to flaunt it by bringing your asshole lover here. Her taunting only fueled my frustration. Why don't you find another bar then? I like it here, and we'll keep coming until you talk to me, she challenged. You don't want to talk, you want to justify your actions. I shot back, my tone icy. But I don't care why you did it. What matters is that you did. This is my place, it's been my hangout for years. You don't care about Donnie's, you just want to rub it in that you're with this dipshit now. I'm warning you, you won't like what happens if you keep showing up here. Keeping my word to Donnie, I turned to leave. But Mr. Macho couldn't let it rest. Hey asshole, I've got a few things to say to you. He piped up, emerging from the booth and clutching Gloria's hand. I turned to face him, begrudgingly admitting that the guy had a certain charm. Though not as imposing as me, standing at about 6 feet and probably weighing around 190 pounds, he exuded a certain presence. Clad in a sharp sports jacket, stylish shirt, and designer jeans, he could have easily graced the cover of GQ magazine. Designer jeans, for crying out loud, I thought, incredulous. What do you want, Mr. GQ? I couldn't resist needling him a little. First of all, whatever concerns Gloria concerns me, we're friends. Second, you don't get to boss her or me around, we'll go wherever we want, whenever we want, and third, I'm a third-degree black belt, so you don't scare me, he retorted, his smirk growing as he stepped closer to me. I couldn't fathom what was going through his mind. Perhaps his martial arts training had inflated his confidence, or maybe he thought displaying fearlessness would make me back down. Or perhaps he was simply showing off for Gloria. But Gloria intervened, cautioning him, Frank, don't. He's like a dangerous animal when he's in this mood. Well, Mr. GQ, you'd better heed your friend, because your mouth is writing checks your body can't cash. Take some good advice and get out of my face, I warned him. That's when he struck me. I'll give him credit. He was fast, and I didn't see it coming. His fist connected with my nose, sending me stumbling back. Before I could recover, he landed another blow, causing me to trip over a chair and land hard on the floor, taking a table and a couple of chairs down with me. As I regained my footing, Frank stood before me in some kind of kung fu stance, graying cockily. Without hesitation, I hurled one of the broken chairs at him. When he dodged it, I seized the opportunity and delivered a swift kick to his groin. It wasn't exactly sporting, I knew, but where I grew up, you did whatever it took to win. Doubled over in pain, Frank became an easy target. I grabbed his hair, hoisted his head, and unleashed a powerful blow with my fist. He crumpled to the ground, and though I had wanted to teach him a lesson for some time, I restrained myself, fearing I might go too far. Gloria's screams filled the air as I knelt down beside him, holding his head up once more. One thing they forgot to teach you at the dojo, Frank boy, is that every once in a while, you run into someone you shouldn't mess with. Guess what? I met Guy, I asserted, dropping his head and rising to my feet, my gaze fixed on Gloria. You're the one who should be lying there, bitch. This is all your fault. Now get this piece of shit out of here before you join him, I commanded. Normally, I'd never lay a hand on a woman, but my patience was wearing thin. Gloria's eyes bore into me with a mixture of anger and something unexpected, sadness. She knelt beside Frank and muttered, Damn you, Chris. Why won't you listen? With effort, she helped Frank to his feet and guided him towards the door. Returning to the bar, I was met by Donnie with another drink. I enjoyed the show, big guy, even if you did break a few things, he chuckled. Sorry about the mess. I tried to walk away, I replied, feeling a twinge of guilt. I'll cover the damages. Nah, that jerk knocked you into the table. He's the one who should be footing the bill. Don't sweat it, 
Donnie assured me. As I sipped my drink, the scene was interrupted by the arrival of police and EMTs. They approached me from behind, ordering me to stand and place my hands on the bar, informing me that I was under arrest. But before they could proceed, a chorus of voices, nearly 30 witnesses, rose in unison, explaining that I had acted in self-defense. Turning to Donnie, the officers asked if he wished to file a complaint about the fight and the damaged fixtures, but he simply laughed and shook his head. No way, he said, dismissing the notion. The EMT tending to me explained that they had been called in after reports of a bar fight reached them, prompting them to alert the police. After assessing my injuries, he informed me that I needed to head to the ER. My nose was definitely broken, and the gash above my eye required stitches. It wasn't the first time my nose had taken a hit, but Frank must have landed a solid blow, because everything after that was a blur. I promised to head to the hospital as soon as I finished my drink, eliciting a chuckle from the EMT. His partner returned from outside, reporting that the guy out there had a broken nose as well. He added with a smirk that Frank's groin was likely to be sore for a while. In even exchange I mused, perhaps I was even better off, considering Frank wouldn't be enjoying intimate moments with Gloria anytime soon. But then again, neither would I, gazing at my reflection in the mirror, taking in the swollen nose and the cut above my eye, I couldn't help but reflect on the series of events that had led me to my current battered state. Growing up, my mother played the role of both parents after my dad vanished when I was just eight. Alongside my grandmother, she raised me and my older brother Jacob, who was 12 at the time. Despite our modest means, we never lacked clean clothes for school, food on the table, or a roof over our heads. Our neighborhood wasn't quite the inner city, but it wasn't far off. It was a rough environment for a young boy to navigate, and many of my peers ended up on the wrong side of the law. Jacob and I, however, managed to stay out of trouble, thanks to the guiding influence of our mom and grandma. It wasn't fear of the police or jail that kept us on the straight and narrow, it was the thought of disappointing our ladies. The idea of seeing their disapproving looks, if we ever got caught stealing or worse, was simply unbearable. Jacob shared the same sentiment. When he turned 17, Jacob enlisted in the Marine Corps with mom's blessing. After completing boot camp, he came home for a brief two-week visit. I wouldn't see him again until my senior year of high school, a four-year gap, and it would be several more years before our paths crossed again. My ladies instilled in me the value of education, ensuring I studied hard and learned as much as I could in school. Despite lacking the funds for college after high school, I followed in my brother's footsteps and joined the military. Enlisting for four years, I found myself unexpectedly assigned to the Corps of Engineers after basic training and AIT. It was there that I discovered a passion for construction that would shape my future. My first sergeant held me in high regard for my strong work ethic and willingness to lend a hand on any project, regardless of whether it fell within my expertise. As my tour drew to a close, the Army dangled a re-enlistment bonus before me, but I declined. My heart yearned to return home, to reunite with my mom and grandma, and to contribute financially as they had supported me. So, bidding farewell to the Army and the engineers, I headed back home. Luck was on my side, and I secured a position as an apprentice rough carpenter in construction. Over time, I diversified my skills, becoming a versatile worker in various construction specialties. Three years later, I crossed paths with Gloria. Our encounter took place at the bank where she worked as a teller. Needing to cash some checks, I accompanied a friend to set up an account. It was Gloria who handled my transaction, and soon enough, I found myself eagerly waiting in line just to exchange a few words with her. Though other tellers offered their assistance, I held out for Gloria. After two months of these brief interactions, I mustered the courage to ask her out to a movie. I was starting to think I'd have to make the first move, she replied with a smile. I'd love to go to a movie with you. Our dates became a regular occurrence, occurring at least once a week, sometimes more, over the next three months. Following our sixth outing, Gloria extended an invitation to her apartment. I didn't leave until the following day. In addition to her stunning looks, Gloria possessed an uninhibited nature in the bedroom that left me utterly captivated.
Despite our growing connection, Gloria continued to go on dates with other men. We hadn't explicitly agreed to exclusivity, so I felt hesitant to broach the subject. Still, the thought of her possibly sharing intimate moments with others gnawed at me. We had plans for dinner on Friday followed by dancing on Saturday, and I intended to express my feelings and suggest we become exclusive during our dinner date. As we sat down for an after-dinner drink, I prepared to broach the subject, but Gloria spoke up first, catching me off guard. Chris, I hate to do this, but I need to cancel our plans for tomorrow night. Something urgent came up, and I won't be able to make it. I promise I'll make it up to you, she explained, genuine regret evident in her tone. Sure, no problem. We can go dancing next Saturday instead. But what happened? What's the emergency? I asked, not reading too much into the cancellation, but curious nonetheless. Gloria's gaze dropped, and she hesitated to respond. Alarm bells began to ring in my mind. Something wasn't right. Gloria, what's going on? I pressed, a note of urgency creeping into my voice. She sighed heavily before meeting my gaze. One of the other guys I see occasionally had an emergency, and he needs my help. What kind of emergency? And how can you help? I inquired, a sinking feeling settling in. This didn't bode well. Well, Frank's got this awards dinner for his company tomorrow, and his date came down with the flu or something and can't make it. So he asked me to step in, and I agreed. Gloria explained, her words tinged with uncertainty. Why does he need you to go? Can't he attend on his own? I questioned. It would seem odd if he showed up solo, especially with his boss and colleagues there. It might reflect poorly on him, like he didn't care enough to find a date, she clarified, attempting to justify her decision. Let me get this straight. You're ditching our plans that we made over a week ago to accompany another guy who only asked you yesterday. Is that what's happening, Gloria? Sarcasm dripped from my words. It's not like that, Chris. This is an urgent situation, she defended herself. That's exactly what it sounds like. I'm just relieved none of his other girlfriends fell ill. You probably considered that an emergency too and rushed to his aid. I retorted, my frustration palpable. Gloria seemed taken aback by my reaction, evidently expecting me to accept her explanation without question. I signaled for the check, settled the bill, and rose from my seat. Let's go. I brought you here, so I'll take you home. But after that, you're on your own, I informed Gloria sternly. The journey home was filled with tension. Despite Gloria's attempts to explain her actions once more, I remained silent, refusing to engage in conversation. Pulling up in front of Gloria's apartment, I reached across her and unlocked the door. Aren't you coming in tonight, Chris? She asked. You've got to be kidding me, Gloria. Get out. I responded, my voice carrying more intensity than intended. She complied, and I sped off, leaving skid marks in my wake. On Sunday morning, Gloria's name flashed on my phone screen. Without uttering a word, I ended the call. Persistent, she rang again, but this time I let the voicemail handle it. Her message was lengthy, explaining that her attendance at Frank's dinner wasn't romantic, merely a favor. She professed her feelings for me, urging us to have a conversation. Once the message concluded, I deleted it without hesitation. Over the next two weeks, whenever I visited the bank to cash my checks, I made a concerted effort to avoid Gloria. If her window was open, I opted for another teller. Ignoring her attempts to engage me, I steadfastly refused to acknowledge her. Some might label my actions as childish, but to them, I say, you weren't the one betrayed. It wasn't a matter of pride, it was pure, unadulterated anger at being treated so callously. Three weeks to the day, as I wrapped up a job site, I spotted Gloria leaning against the fender of my truck. Damn it, I thought, how did she track me down? Loading my gear into the truck bed, I unlocked the driver's door. Chris, she called out, almost shouting. You have to talk to me, eventually. No, I don't, I replied firmly, climbing into the truck. Are you just going to leave me here? I caught a ride with a friend and don't have a way back to the city, she expressed her concern. Could you at least give me a ride home? Oh hell, I muttered to myself, realizing I couldn't just abandon her here. I motioned for her to hop in, and we drove in silence. Despite her attempts to start a conversation, 
I signaled for her to stop and remained silent. Eventually, she got the hint and stayed quiet until we reached her place. As I reached across to open her door, Gloria unexpectedly snatched my truck keys and leaped out. Now you're going to talk to me, or you'll just have to wait here, she declared with a smug grin. I exited the truck, retrieved the spare key from the wheel well's magnetic holder, and held it up for Gloria to see. Climbing back into the cab, I started the engine, determined not to let her dictate the terms of our conversation. Chris, please, this isn't fair, she pleaded, her voice tinged with desperation. She had a point, it was time to address the situation. I glanced at her and gave a slight nod. Go ahead, talk, I allowed. Come inside and I'll make you coffee or a drink, she offered. I paused for a moment, then replied, I'm good. Start talking. That night with Frank wasn't what you think. He just needed a companion for the evening. It wasn't a romantic date, she explained. We simply attended the dinner and came straight home. Yeah, but what happened when you got home? I countered, my tone laced with bitterness. Gloria looked shocked and impulsively hurled her keys in my direction. Screw you, Chris, she shouted, turning to retreat into her apartment. I'm sorry, I called out after her, realizing my comment had crossed a line. That was uncalled for, and I apologize. Please come back, and let's resolve this. She visibly calmed down and responded, I don't understand why you're so upset. I told you it was an emergency situation. No, Gloria. An emergency is when Frank calls and says he's cut off a finger or a hand, begging for a ride to the hospital. An emergency is when he calls, claiming he's fallen and broken his leg, desperately needing your assistance. Those are emergencies. Frank needing a date is not an emergency, I stated firmly, stepping out of the truck to face Gloria directly. Don't you see? When you broke our date to go out with him, regardless of the reason, you were indicating that I don't matter to you as much as he does. I was already unhappy about you dating other guys, and then you tell me that I'm not important enough for you to keep our date. I confessed, realizing the depth of my hurt by Gloria's actions. While I was familiar with my anger, the hurt took me by surprise. Gloria apologized once more, coaxing me into further conversation. Eventually, she persuaded me to join her inside for coffee, and then she convinced me to stay for dinner. I didn't leave until the next morning. Yeah, I know, I caved in. What can I say? I was half in love with her, and when she emerged from her room wearing nothing but high heels, my judgment flew out the window. Gloria hadn't changed during the three weeks we hadn't seen each other, she remained an attractive dynamo. The army and my time with construction crews taught me a lot, work ethic, doing the job right, and being dependable. But they didn't teach me how to navigate relationships with women. So, against my better judgment, I took her back. Gloria and I became exclusive, or going steady, as they used to say. We didn't see other people. This arrangement continued for about six months. She never broke another date with me, but there were a few nights she couldn't go out. She claimed she was visiting her mother or having a girl's night out or some other seemingly innocent excuse. Gloria and I didn't officially move in together, but we spent very few nights apart. I thought, if this is what married life is like, count me in. After a movie one evening, I proposed to her in Donnie's, of all places. It might not have been the most romantic setting, but Gloria seemed to appreciate the gesture. Through tears of joy, she said yes. We planned to tie the knot in three months, and I eagerly looked forward to building a family together, maybe even having kids. However, the month after I popped the question, I started hearing whispers about Gloria. A few of the guys from work teased me about having an open relationship with her on more than one occasion. I brushed it off as harmless banter until one night at Donnie's when Wendy, a friend and Winston's sister, approached me. Gloria was out with her girlfriends, and I was flying solo that evening. Where's Gloria tonight? Wendy asked, her curiosity peak more than usual. Hey Wendy, she's out with some of the girls from the bank again. I might have to read that in once we're married, I joked. Chris, you might want to check up on your woman. She's been up to some things an engaged girl shouldn't be doing, Wendy said, her tone somber. What are you talking about, Wendy? Normally, I dismiss gossip and rumors, but coming from a close friend like Wendy, it made me pause. 
Wendy hesitantly confided in me that on three or four occasions over the past two months, she had spotted Gloria at Tommy's, and she wasn't alone. According to Wendy, Gloria was in the company of a handsome, well-dressed guy, and their interaction seemed more than just casual acquaintanceship. They danced intimately, getting close to each other in a way that didn't seem appropriate for someone in a committed relationship. Wendy assured me that there was nothing explicitly scandalous happening, but it certainly wouldn't pass the boyfriend test. I'm really sorry, Chris, but you're my friend and I hate seeing you being taken advantage of, Wendy concluded, her concern evident. I thanked Wendy for her honesty, finished my drink, and left. If it had been anyone other than Wendy, I might have dismissed it, but her words stuck with me. It was only around 10 p.m., and I debated whether I should check on Gloria. Memories of her emergency date with Frank and her recent girls' nights out flashed through my mind. Before I knew it, I found myself in Tommy's parking lot, a large club across town. Inside, the atmosphere was lively, with a bar along one wall and tables surrounding the dance floor. It was crowded for a weeknight, but I managed to find a spot at the bar where I could observe the dance floor. It didn't take long to spot Gloria. She had just finished dancing and returned to a table with several other people, including two guys. Most of them seemed to be Gloria's co-workers, which initially put me at ease. However, my relief was short-lived. Gloria and her dance partner sat down together, and he whispered something to her before wrapping his arm around her and pulling her close. She smiled and kissed him, not just a friendly peck, but a full-on passionate kiss that made my blood boil. Gloria wore a summery dress with thin shoulder straps that left her shoulders exposed, showcasing ample cleavage. After their kiss, the guy's hand lingered over her shoulder, his fingers occasionally grazing the top of her breast. Gloria seemed to revel in the attention, reciprocating by caressing his leg. Wendy's warning echoed in my mind. Gloria's behavior was far from acceptable for someone in a committed relationship. Downing the last of my drink, I pushed away from the bar and made my way toward Gloria and her companion. I had no intention of causing trouble, but I refused to tolerate this disrespect. Our engagement was clearly over, and I wanted my ring back, or so I told myself. But deep down, I hoped her friend and his companions would give me a reason to act. As I approached the room divider, my friend Winston intercepted me, blocking my path. He grabbed my arm, urging me to leave. Ignoring his attempts to dissuade me, I shook off his hand and turned back toward Gloria and her friends. Chris, don't do this, Winston pleaded. Going over there will only lead to trouble, and you don't need that. I'm not looking for trouble. I just want my ring back from that woman, and I'm going to get it. No drama, I'll just get my ring and tell Gloria it's over, I insisted. Bullshit, I can see it in your eyes. If you approach them, things will escalate, and someone will get hurt. You don't want to end up in jail over this, Winston mourned, his tone firm. I listened to Winston's warning, but was determined to push past him. Stay out of it, Winston. If I have to move you aside, I will, I asserted, trying to brush past him. He shook his head in disbelief, stepping back. I can't believe you're letting that cheating woman ruin your life. You're making a mistake, go ahead he muttered in frustration. As I attempted to move forward, I was met by Wendy standing firmly in my path. Are you going to push me aside too, Chris? Because if you do, you'll have to deal with me. I won't let you end up in jail tonight, she declared, hands on her hips, her gaze unwavering. I paused, taken aback by Wendy's unexpected intervention. Despite the gravity of the situation, there was a hint of humor in the absurdity of the scene, a petite woman standing up to a towering man to prevent him from making a rash decision. Having good friends was a blessing. Wendy and Winston's intervention had jolted me into rational thought instead of reacting impulsively. They were right. Approaching Gloria in that moment would only lead to trouble. After some persuasion from Winston and Wendy, I agreed to confront Gloria in a more private setting, preferably when she was alone. It was a sensible plan. I had no intention of harming Gloria physically, but I was determined to retrieve my ring and sever ties with her. As I drove home, I mulled over the situation. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I needed to resolve things swiftly. Parking a couple of houses away from Gloria's place, I waited for her to return. She shouldn't be too late, 
given that she had work the next day. As soon as I saw Gloria and the guy from the club arrive at her apartment, hand in hand, I knew tonight was the night to settle things. Whether she came home alone or with him, I was going to confront her and retrieve my ring. It was time to put an end to this charade. Around midnight, they arrived at Gloria's door, wrapped up in each other's arms. Their passionate embrace left no room for doubt. They were fully engaged in making out, tongues intertwined, bodies pressed close. Despite the pain of witnessing their intimacy, I didn't hesitate. I marched straight to Gloria's door, their obliviousness giving me an advantage. When Gloria finally noticed me, she recoiled, startled. Chris, what are you doing here? She exclaimed, panic evident in her voice. I'm here to end things with my deceitful, unfaithful fiancé. Give me back my ring, I demanded, seizing her hand and swiftly removing the engagement ring. Gloria's protests came in a flurry of clichés. Wait, it's not what it looks like. Frank's just a friend. We weren't doing anything. It doesn't mean anything, she pleaded, desperation tainting her words. Enough with the lies, Gloria, I said firmly, cutting through her attempts to deny the truth. Her eyes widened, hands instinctively rising to cover her face. I saw you with your friend at Tommy's. I witnessed the kissing, the hugging, his hand on you, and your eager response to his advances. And just now, I saw the makeout session right outside your door. As I confronted Gloria, Frank interjected, placing his hand on my arm, urging me to step away. Frank, you wouldn't be here if she hadn't invited you. So, I'll give you fair warning. Take your hand off me and stay out of this, I asserted, meeting his gaze squarely. He tensed, preparing to confront me, but Gloria intervened, stepping between us. Frank, please leave. Don't make things worse, she implored, her voice tinged with desperation. Reluctantly, Frank stepped back and made his way to his car. I'll call you tomorrow, Gloria, he said with a smirk directed at me. Don't leave on my account, Frank. Stay, go inside, and finish what you two started at the door, I retorted. Turning to Gloria, I delivered the final blow. It doesn't matter anymore because we're done, Gloria. I strode past Frank, heading toward my truck. Gloria trailed behind, tearful and pleading for my attention. But I remained silent, reaching my truck and driving off. After a few blocks, I had to pull over, overcome with shaking from the boiling anger inside. I needed to regain control before I did something I'd regret. After about 10 minutes of sitting in my truck, I restarted the engine and decided to head back to Gloria's. I couldn't explain why I felt compelled to do so, but I needed to know if Frank had stayed or left. As I drove past Gloria's apartment, I noticed that his car was gone. Surprisingly, that brought me some sense of relief. It's a cliché, but it's undeniably true. You can't just turn off your feelings for someone like a faucet, no matter what they've done. Even when you hate them, it's often because you still love them in some capacity. I suppose that's why I found solace in the fact that Frank hadn't spent the night at Gloria's. So here I am, nursing my Jack Daniels at Donnie's, contemplating which hospital to visit. I made a promise to the EMT, and truth be told, my throbbing nose and swollen eye are nudging me in that direction anyway. Gloria had been persistent with her calls after the incident at her door, but I steadfastly refused to engage. She'd insist that we needed to talk, and each time I'd bluntly refuse, hanging up without a second thought. Eventually, after about eight or nine attempts, it seemed like she finally got the hint. That's when she started showing up at Donnie's. A couple of nights after the confrontation, I was nursing my usual drink, showcasing the stitches over my eye and the bandage on my nose. Jack Daniels had become my reluctant companion in navigating through the nights. The bar was relatively quiet, with only about 20 regulars scattered around. Suddenly, a hush fell over the place, that classic moment where you could hear a pin drop. I glanced at the mirror behind the bar and spotted Gloria standing there. Oh, not again, I thought to myself. Chris, please talk to me, she pleaded. Just a few minutes, and then I promise I won't come into Donnie's anymore, if that's what you want. Fine, Gloria. Grab a booth, I relented. I'll get another drink and join you. Want something? After fetching my drink and a white wine for her, I settled into the booth across from Gloria. By the way, where's Frank boy? Didn't he want to join you? 
I couldn't resist a touch of sarcasm. She managed a slight smile. No, he said he never wanted to lay eyes on you again. Seems you rattled his confidence in his black belt. Bringing him along was a mistake, I admit. I thought it might provoke you into talking to me. Clearly, I was wrong, huh? You wanted to talk, so talk. Let's get this over with, I urged, eager to keep my pain hidden from her gaze. Gloria launched into the usual cliches, offering apologies and excuses that fell on deaf ears. She claimed it didn't mean anything, that it wasn't what it looked like, and that she loved me, but I wasn't buying it. I let her spout all the familiar bullshit until she finally ran out of steam after about five minutes. Enough, I interjected sharply. First of all, you don't cheat on or lie to someone you love. Let me tell you what it looked like. At the club, it looked like you were lovers. At your door, it looked like you two were humping each other like dogs in heat. That's what it looked like. And it did mean something. It meant everything to me. It meant that the woman I loved, my fiancé, the woman I was going to spend the rest of my life with, was a cheating bitch. No, don't start crying now, it's too late for that bullshit. Gloria's sobs grew louder, but she managed to compose herself enough for me to continue. I heard rumors and gossip about you partying with some guy on your girl's nights out, but I refused to believe it. I didn't want to believe that my lady would do that. It wasn't until a close friend told me she saw you that I knew you were cheating. I recounted, pausing to take a drink. Gloria seized the opportunity to interject. But I didn't cheat. I didn't sleep with Frank. We just danced and fooled around a little. Maybe I did let things go too far that night, but I wasn't going to sleep with him. I wasn't, Chris, she insisted. It isn't just about that one night, although that's a big part of it, I pressed on. You used your girls' nights as an excuse to spend time with Frank and lied to me about it. The first time you lied to me, you cheated. The first time you let him hold you too close as you danced, you cheated. The first time you hugged him or the first time you kissed him, you were cheating. Anger bubbled up within me once more, and I struggled to keep it in check. The fact that you didn't sleep with him doesn't change the fact that you were cheating, Gloria, I asserted firmly. I believe you would have slept with him if things had stayed the way they were. The next time, you probably would have invited Frank in. Let me ask you something. If you had known I was at Tommy's, would you have still acted the way you did with Frank? If I had been at your door, would you still have had the makeout session that I saw? Gloria hung her head for a few seconds before looking over at me. No, I wouldn't have done any of that if you had been there. It wouldn't have been right, and you wouldn't have liked it. Then what makes you think it was all right to do that shit behind my back? I paused, waiting for an answer, but she couldn't or wouldn't give me one. Okay, Gloria, we've had our talk and nothing has changed, I continued, my tone resigned. You say you love me. Well, that's your misfortune. I still love you, and that's my cross to bear. At least until I can get you out of my heart. Now I expect you to keep your promise and stay out of Donnie's. Goodbye, Gloria. With that, I got up and returned to the bar. Donnie saw me coming and had another drink waiting for me. It took a few minutes, but Gloria got up, walked past me, and out the door. I never saw her or Frank again. Later, I heard that she quit her job at the bank and moved to the West Coast, alone. It's been two years since Gloria and I went our separate ways. Donnie still sees me almost every night, but these days it's mostly for club soda or coffee. The Jack Daniels still makes an appearance, but only on weekends, and even then, I'm careful. Talking things out with Gloria that night helped me realize I didn't need it as much as I thought. Do I miss her? Absolutely, especially her in bed. She was unmatched. But it's more than just physical. I miss the idea of us, of having a family, and sharing a life with someone I love. Am I bitter? No, not really. I still dream of marriage and family. I haven't found anyone who ignites that spark in me like Gloria did. Still, I keep searching. I'm still in construction, but I know I'll have to find a way out soon. That fall from the scaffold wrecked my knee, and while I can tough it out for now, I know it won't last forever. About six months ago, my brother Jacob returned home with a wounded leg from his time in some far-flung, war-torn country. He relies on a cane to get around, but that's all right. Thankfully, he won't have to trek far behind the bar. Donnie, the previous owner, decided it was time to retire. 
Jacob and I seized the opportunity and bought the bar together. We managed to scrape together most of the cash ourselves, and Donnie helped finance the rest. Maybe I'll transition into the office, handling construction planning or scheduling, but even if I don't, I'm content with my stake in the bar. Plus, we've already started cutting back on expenses by doing away with the need for a bouncer. So here I am, embarking on a new career path and still on the lookout for the right woman. In the meantime, as an English friend of mine likes to say, life goes on. That was the first part of the story. A new video with the second part will be out soon. The second story. My primary concern throughout my life has been my physical appearance. I don't fit the typical image of a knight in shining armor that many women dream of. Standing at an average height, I'm a simple guy with minimal body fat. My features, like my broad nose and deep-set, squinty eyes, don't exactly add to my charm. Though I'm fortunate to have all my teeth and hair, it doesn't elevate my overall appeal. Working as a heavy equipment operator, I keep my sandy hair trimmed short for practicality, it's easier to maintain and keeps out of my face. Despite my perceived shortcomings, I consider myself lucky to have found a woman to share my life with. Grace, while not conventionally stunning, was perfectly beautiful to me. Standing at five foot two, she was petite compared to me. She embraced my quirks and teased me affectionately, creating an atmosphere of comfort and acceptance in our relationship. We tied the knot early in life and were blessed with two children, 16-year-old Dave and his younger sister Monica. Thankfully, they inherited more of their mother's looks than mine. Both kids were bright and well-behaved, filling me with pride as a father and adding to the contentment of our family life. I was employed by my Uncle Henry, working as a heavy equipment operator in what amounted to a family-run enterprise. While Uncle Henry was the one overseeing operations, the rest of us received salaries and put in as many hours as possible. At the end of each year, any profits not earmarked for new equipment were divvied up among the family members, a setup that suited us well. Meanwhile, Grace found employment at a small company specializing in property appraisals for banks and investment firms. Although she wasn't directly involved in the appraisal process, she handled various clerical tasks such as typing, filing, and data entry. Life was comfortable, and I should have been content with that. However, it was a seemingly insignificant incident that sparked a chain of unsettling thoughts. I happened to notice what looked like a hickey on my wife's neck. Normally, I would have playfully teased her about it, but this time, for some inexplicable reason, I held back. I knew I hadn't caused it, and it could have been a bug bite or an ingrown hair, but her efforts to conceal it with makeup at home only fueled my unease. While I could understand her desire to cover it up when going out, I couldn't shake the question of why she felt the need to do so at home. If Grace was seeing someone else, it would have to be during the day. She never ventured out alone at night, and I was always by her side when she did. I was certain she wasn't meeting anyone at our house. The thought gnawed at me for an entire week, even after the love bite had faded, leaving only the lingering memory. Our intimate life remained intact. While perhaps I wasn't as romantic as I could have been, I made efforts, buying her flowers unexpectedly, never forgetting her birthday or our anniversary. We dined out regularly, caught shows or movies when time allowed, and annually embarked on family vacations to special destinations. I valued her deeply as both a wife and a companion. Yet here I was driving myself mad over a trivial red mark on her neck. With work slowing down, Uncle Henry had no qualms about granting me a few days off. Unsure of what I was seeking or what I would do, I resolved to shadow Grace and see if anything transpired. Borrowing a car from a colleague, I armed myself with a crossword puzzle book and began my surveillance. For two days, nothing of note occurred. I trailed her to work, joined her for lunch, and returned home with her. I started feeling foolish until the third day. Grace emerged from her office for lunch slightly earlier than usual. Instead of heading towards her car, she strolled around to the side of the building. As if on cue, a white four-door company car appeared from the rear, and Grace slipped into the passenger seat. It seemed she was off to lunch with a coworker. It was a deviation from the routine of the past two days, but nothing overly alarming. 
I trailed them effortlessly, only to have my worst suspicions confirmed. The white car pulled into the parking lot of a shabby motel near the interstate ramp. I recognized the man as one of the appraisers Grace worked alongside, Luke something. He already possessed a key. They entered the room with a practiced ease, drawing the curtains and shutting the blinds behind them. Luke, considerably younger than Grace, possessed a striking appearance that added to my dismay. Regrettably, I hadn't planned beyond this point. Uncertain of my next move, my emotions overwhelmed reason. I contemplated waiting until Grace returned home that evening to confront her, but impatience won out. Exiting my car, I made my way to the motel door. The building, an older establishment, featured wooden door frames that, despite any safety latches, seemed susceptible to a well-placed shove. Roughly ten minutes had passed since they entered the room. I halted a passing housekeeper, urgently instructing her to dial 911. Initially bewildered by my request, she promptly reached for her phone. I decided to grant them another five minutes before considering more forceful action, though my patience waned after only two. I crashed into the door with all my might, using my right shoulder as a battering ram. The safety lock buckled under the force, causing the hinges to rip out of the wall. The door thundered to the ground with a deafening crash, startling Grace and her lover. They lay naked in the bed, and before he could even react, I seized him by the neck. The sight of my wife entangled with another man sent me into a rage beyond comprehension. It was his fault, knowing she was married, and hers for the same reason. Fury consumed me entirely. My wife had never witnessed such violence for me before. Luke faltered under the initial onslaught, unable to move or catch his breath. I took my time, methodically delivering blow after blow. Amidst the chaos, Grace pleaded for me to stop, even attempting to intervene at one point. In the heat of the moment, my elbow inadvertently struck her mouth as I recoiled from a strike. She went flying across the room, and then everything went dark. When I came to, I found myself handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. MCs wheeled Luke out on a gurney, and Grace stood by the ambulance, her lip being tended to with a motel sheet wrapped around her. As she caught sight of me in the cruiser, she burst into tears. A female police officer escorted her back into the room as the police car pulled away from the motel parking lot. I didn't contest the charges or request a lawyer or trial. Justice was swift, and my actions were deemed premeditated since I had instructed the maid to call 911 before breaking down the door, but the specifics of the verdict mattered little to me. I was handed a two-year jail sentence. Before heading off to the state lockup, my brother Martin was the only one who managed to see me. He pledged to visit again once things had calmed down. Life in my new surroundings proved relatively uneventful, particularly once word spread about the circumstances that landed me there. It took ten days before Martin made another appearance. Walter, I thought about bringing you some cigarettes, but then I remembered you don't smoke, he joked, attempting to lighten the mood. Enough with the jokes, Martin. What's going on at home? Nobody's filled me in, and all I get here are rumors and nonsense, I pressed. It's about as bad as it could be. The kids and the rest of the family are devastated. Grace has been holed up in the house since it all went down. Dave and Monica have been staying with mom and dad, but they're planning to return home later this week. As for Grace, she's not talking to anyone. Jane, her sister, tried to visit, but Grace wouldn't let her in. Is Grace communicating with the kids? I inquired. Not a chance. They tried reaching out, but she won't budge. I doubt she'll open up about what really happened to anyone, Martin replied. I assume she's not going to work, I continued. She hasn't stepped out of the house. It won't be long before she runs out of food, Martin remarked. And who's taking care of the bills? I probed further. I'm not sure. I'll ask Dave to look into it later this week. Monica's determined to get back home, one way or another, Martin explained. What about the guy? I asked. His name's Luke Rivera. He's still in the hospital and might be there for a couple more weeks, Martin answered. What? All I did was give him a rough beating. Why is he still in the hospital? I reacted. You really did a number on him, Walter. Multiple injuries and fractures. He's on a liquid diet and has some eye issues, Martin replied. 
I guess I lost control, I conceded. It seems that way, Martin agreed. I think I need to talk to the kids. Can you bring them next time you visit? I requested. Sure thing, Martin agreed before leaving. After Martin departed, I compiled a list of tasks based on what he told me about Grace's situation. I felt a sense of responsibility to ensure the household continued to function smoothly, at least until the kids finished school. Five days later, Dave and Monica arrived, sans Martin. Where's your uncle? I inquired. He had to work. I picked up mom's car from her office, and we decided to drive up here ourselves. Dave answered, visibly proud of himself. Why was mom's car at the office? I questioned. It's been there since the day you were arrested. Mom never retrieved it. She hasn't driven or left the house since, Dave explained. Is she okay? I inquired, concern etched on my face. Monica shook her head, her gaze lifting. No, she's not talking and just seems lost. She won't respond to questions and refuses to answer the phone. The answering machine is full. I tried to handle as many calls as I could, mainly from relatives. There were even reporters trying to get through, she relayed. Do you two want to stay with your grandparents or will you be okay at home? I asked, worried about their well-being. I think we'll manage, Dad. We just need to establish some sort of routine, Dave assured me confidently. I felt a sense of relief seeing my children taking charge of the situation. Over the next hour, we brainstormed various strategies for managing their situation, and I offered my assistance where possible. Still receiving my salary, I proposed setting up auto pay for all the utility bills. I advised Monica to retrieve her mother's ATM card, enabling them to access cash and use it as a debit card for other expenses. Dave agreed to handle yard work and vehicle maintenance, while also assisting Monica with household chores and cooking. Apparently, Grace was still capable of caring for herself, but had withdrawn from social interaction entirely. Monica mentioned her mother's newfound compulsion for cleanliness and home organization, though it remained unclear whether this was a positive or negative development. Before departing, I instructed Monica to convey to her mother my desire to discuss what had transpired. Monica expressed doubts about Grace's willingness to engage, but she promised to make the effort. Despite Monica and Dave's persistent attempts, Grace never visited me in prison, nor did she call or write. Their efforts to reach her proved futile, even with the involvement of Grace's sister, Jane. Six months elapsed with no clarity or explanation from my wife. Regular visits from Dave, Monica, and Martin provided some solace, although a few colleagues taking a day off to jest at my expense added a peculiar twist to the routine. Within a fortnight of Luke Rivera's injury, his wife served him with divorce papers. He found himself in a dire financial predicament, burdened with child support, alimony, and mortgage payments. Following his discharge from the hospital, Luke was transferred to a rehabilitation center. As his medical bills surpassed his insurance coverage, he opted to sue me, a legal labyrinth I struggled to comprehend. Fortunately, Uncle Henry intervened. In a matter of days, our company lawyer countered with lawsuits against Rivera for alienation of affection and against the company where Rivera and Grace were employed. The lawyer's adept maneuvers led to a sudden dissolution of all legal proceedings on both sides. Though I didn't receive any compensation, I also avoided any financial liabilities. Three months later, the domestic scene remained unchanged. Dave had completed his schooling and enlisted in the Air Force, set to depart in a month's time. With Monica now possessing her driver's license, they felt confident that his absence wouldn't present logistical hurdles. However, Grace persisted in her refusal to answer phone calls and remained confined to the house. While she wasn't directly causing issues for Monica, the status quo seemed unsustainable. Grace had begun flatly refusing Monica's attempts to facilitate communication between us or to arrange visits. Following Dave's departure, Monica started visiting me alone, occasionally accompanied by Martin. Grace's sister Jane made a solitary visit, though her purpose remained a mystery to me. Approaching nearly a year into my sentence, my wife had withdrawn completely, refusing to engage with me or anyone else. I dedicated countless hours to pondering our predicament. Grace never extended an apology, nor sought forgiveness, 
nor provided any explanation for her infidelity. She offered no ideas on how to mend our relationship or rectify the situation. In her eyes, nothing had gone awry, and her disregard for my feelings made me feel insignificant and dismissed. It seemed she deemed me unworthy of her time or consideration, leaving me feeling like an inconsequential nuisance. A mere annoyance to be rid of once Walter's problem was resolved. These thoughts consumed me, igniting an inner rage that simmered beneath the surface. Luke Rivera had completed his rehabilitation and settled into an efficiency apartment near his workplace. According to Martin, he walked with a limp and exhibited a twitch in his right eye, evoking a twinge of sympathy from me, until Monica shared unsettling news. During Grace's shower, Monica sought out Midol from her mother's purse and stumbled upon a prepaid cell phone concealed at the bottom. It contained only one programmed number. Monica meticulously recorded both the phone's number and the stored contact. The revelation was disconcerting. While reconciliation with Grace seemed increasingly unlikely given our circumstances, the notion of her maintaining contact with Rivera ignited a surge of fury within me. Two weeks later, an announcement came, 127 of us would receive early release, and my name was among them. I had navigated my time in jail without incident, secured employment for my release, and carried the status of a first-time offender. It felt like an extraordinary stroke of luck. Martin and Monica arrived to fetch me, and I made the decision to reside at my parents' home for a while, giving Grace time to adjust to my presence. However, this precaution turned out to be unnecessary. Grace had vanished. For the first time in a year, she left the confines of our house without a word or a note, taking most of her belongings with her. It spared me from confronting her about her infidelity again, or rather, she avoided facing me. I looked forward to hearing her explanation although I doubted she would offer one, given her previous silence on the matter. I also learned that Luke Rivera had abruptly quit his job that same week, which struck me as intriguing. Rather than staying with my parents, I opted to move back into the house with Monica. She seemed relieved to have me home, particularly since she had acquired a steady boyfriend in my absence. However, this also meant I spent my evenings alone. Surprisingly, I found myself missing the camaraderie of my cellmates. Any companionship was preferable to solitude. Returning to work within the week, I slipped back into my routine seamlessly, as if I had never left. Feeling indebted to Uncle Henry and the family, I committed myself to putting in extra hours, a commitment that was readily accepted. Strangely, I discovered that my taste for beer had diminished over the past year. Hard liquor had never appealed to me, so I found myself indulging in coke and iced tea instead. Despite some teasing from my colleagues, I remained steadfast in my choices, impervious to peer pressure. The nights were the hardest, filled with thoughts of Grace and Luke Rivera. They made a mockery of me. I didn't even know Rivera, yet the treatment I received from my wife was undeserved. I had never mistreated her, never resorted to physical or verbal abuse. I had always shown her respect and affection. I had done nothing to warrant her disdain. Yet it seemed she didn't hate me, she simply felt nothing at all, discarding me like an old slipper without a second thought. It was a deeply humiliating experience. Marcy did her best to offer support, but there was little she could do to alleviate my pain. I was glad she had found companionship, particularly after the challenges she faced caring for her mother the previous year. I wanted to give her all the time she needed to recover. Meanwhile, I endeavored to conceal my depression, whether at home or at work. Immersing myself in work helped to distract me from thoughts of grace. By the time I returned home, exhaustion often granted me respite, though not always. One Sunday afternoon, I resolved to visit Jane, Grace's younger sister. Divorced with two young children, she had shown me kindness by visiting me during my time in prison, though I couldn't fathom why. Sometimes I wondered if a warmer reception for me might have led to further visits. Walter, how nice to see you. I heard you were back home. Come on in. Would you like coffee or a beer? Jane greeted me warmly as I entered. Coffee would be great, I replied, following her to the kitchen. I suppose I know why you're here. I may not have much information, but I'll assist however I can, Jane offered as she set two steaming cups on the table. 
The biggest question you probably won't be able to answer is why, I admitted, sinking into a chair opposite her. You're right, Walter. I can't help you there. I tried asking her multiple times, in different ways, but she either ignored me or changed the subject, Jane explained. I thought she wasn't speaking to you, I remarked. She wouldn't even see me until a week ago. Then suddenly, she wanted to talk, Jane revealed. A brief silence settled between us, Jane seeming cautious yet willing to offer what information she could. Jane, why did you visit me at Gratterford? I asked, recalling her unexpected appearance during my incarceration. I don't know. I felt Grace had wronged you somehow, and I didn't think you deserved that. But you didn't seem too pleased to see me, so I didn't return, Jane explained. Sorry about that. I was still hurting and didn't know how to react. I guess I was a bit oversensitive, I admitted. Other than what I read in the papers, I still don't know what happened, Jane sighed. I chuckled softly, setting my coffee down. It's simple. She cheated. I caught them, and I dealt with it. End of story. Except you spent a year in jail, Jane pointed out. I like to think of it as a vacation. Better than one of those damn cruises, I joked, but neither of us found much humor in the situation. What are you really here for, Walter? Jane asked, cutting through the tension. Where is she? I inquired bluntly, hoping for a straightforward answer. Reno, Jane replied, surprising me with her candor. Grace came to see me to discuss my divorce. I couldn't provide the answer she was seeking, Jane added, offering a glimpse into Grace's recent actions. Why? I pressed for more insight. She's seeking a divorce that will allow her to sever ties with you completely, without any direct contact or interaction. I informed her that such an arrangement isn't feasible here. She seemed disappointed. Initially hesitant about Nevada due to residency requirements, she ultimately saw it as her only option. Her employer has a branch office in Reno, and the man she's with, Luke something, managed to secure a transfer there. She plans to file for divorce as soon as she meets the residency criteria, Jane explained. It all clicked into place, though I didn't relish the clarity. I couldn't fathom why she didn't initiate the divorce while I was in jail. I would have gladly signed the papers upon receiving them. Her delay seemed to have backfired. What did I do wrong, Jane? I posed that question to my sister as she left. She simply smirked and exited without offering an answer, Jane recounted. I suppose she decided I wasn't attractive enough. I wish she'd realized that before we married, I'm used bitterly. Then you wouldn't have had Dave and Marcy, Jane reminded gently. A faint smile tugged at my lips. True. Walter, my husband was handsome, but he was a scoundrel. Attractiveness isn't reason enough to marry a man. I won't make that mistake again, Jane asserted, her voice firm with resolve. I suppose I'll have to look for a divorcee who used to have a handsome husband. Maybe I'll have better luck next time, I remarked foolishly, only realizing the stupidity of my words once they left my lips. Flustered, I hastily stood up and thanked Jane for the coffee and conversation. It dawned on me why she had visited me at Gratterford. It seemed I wasn't just unattractive, I was also a bit slow on the uptake. As I departed, Jane appeared slightly embarrassed, and I felt a pang of remorse. To distract myself, I booked a week-long Caribbean cruise and gave the ticket to Martin as a gift. Being unmarried, I knew he would relish the trip, especially with my covering the expenses. In return, I borrowed his car, preferring to keep him in the dark about my intentions. It took me three days to drive to Reno. Upon arrival, I located a vacant bank repo house just east of Sparks and easily arranged for Luke Rivera to visit and conduct an appraisal. He arrived equipped with his clipboard and tape measure. Thirty minutes later, he found himself in the trunk of Uncle Martin's car, bound for the east. About thirty miles outside Winnemucca, I found a secluded turnoff that suited my purpose. I wasn't sure where the dirt road led, but I only needed the first mile. Though Luke had been breathing when I stashed him in the trunk, he apparently decided to cease at some point during the journey. It was regrettable, as I had hoped for further conversation. Opting for a desolate ravine with rocky terrain and rugged vegetation, I relieved him of his watch, wallet, and cell phone before disposing of the body. Perhaps someone would stumble upon him eventually, 
but not until the local wildlife had finished with him. Continuing my journey eastward, I found myself feeling somewhat vindicated, though it was a sensation I hadn't anticipated. I'd never considered myself vengeful, but apparently I had it in me. Stopping at a casino in Elko, I discreetly left Luke's wallet in the men's room, confident that someone would stumble upon it and make good use of the credit cards. With no report filed for a missing wallet, no one would likely flag any unauthorized transactions. As for the watch, it held no particular value, so I discarded it in a nearby trash bin. Crossing into Utah, I resolved to call Jane once I reached home. Perhaps it wouldn't lead to much, but at least I could enjoy a nice meal with her at a restaurant. Starting to feel a sense of satisfaction with myself, the ringing of my cell phone interrupted my thoughts. The caller ID displayed the same number Marcy had provided. It seemed I was about to have a conversation with my wife after all. Luke, where the hell are you? Luke, are you there? Answer me, came her frantic voice. My unmistakable gravelly voice would give me away instantly. I'm sorry, you have the wrong number, I responded, feeling a pang of guilt. I listened for a brief moment, just enough to catch my wife's despairing words, Oh God, no. Without hesitation, I tossed the cell phone out of the car window. In a few days, I'd be back home. I could only hope Martin was making the most of my vacation. The Third Story Predicting when a marriage will take a turn for the worse is challenging, especially when it's been grounded in trust for decades. Suddenly, my wife confessed that she fell in love with someone at first sight after 25 years of marriage. I was shocked and devastated, but her next words left me reeling. Remember that scene in The Godfather where Michael Corlun sees a stunning woman in Italy and becomes completely captivated? His Sicilian bodyguards notice and discuss how he's been hit by the thunderbolt and fallen in love. That's not just a Hollywood fabrication. I actually witnessed it firsthand, though I didn't realize it at the time. It happened to my wife. Sadly, it wasn't with me when we first met, but with another man 25 years into our marriage, marking the beginning of the end of what I thought was a perfect life. But I'm jumping ahead. It's a tendency when reflecting on my past life and how things were supposed to unfold. I suppose I should start at the beginning and introduce myself. I'm Gerald Bennett, but everyone just calls me Jerry. I'm 50 years old and I reside in a small Midwestern city about two hours away from Chicago. I work as an accountant for a sizable national firm. It's not the most exciting job, but the pay is good, and except for the busy months of March and April, the hours are typically a solid 40 per week, with no weekends. I was married until two years ago. My ex-wife and I have a daughter named Deborah, who's 25 years old, married, has a child of her own, and lives in Denver. My marriage ended in divorce after 26 years, the first 25 of which I thought were fantastic, as I mentioned earlier. I met Diana at Yale State University in Ames, Aya during my sophomore year. She was also a sophomore, having transferred into my dorm after her freshman year in another building. I first saw her outside the dorm, lying on a towel, basking in Yawa's August sunshine with her athletic figure. Guys, I need to go. I'm about to introduce myself to the future Mrs. Bennett. I joked, not entirely serious. My two friends followed my gaze to Diana. Wow, one of them said. I heard the words, but I couldn't tell you which one of them spoke. I was completely captivated by this blonde goddess lying on a towel in a bikini beside the dorm. Ignoring my friends, I walked over to introduce myself. But when I got about four feet from her, she propped herself up on one elbow and waved me off with her other hand. I felt crushed until she spoke up. Hey, dumbass, you're my son. I immediately shuffled to my right, allowing the sunlight to return to my goddess. She greeted me with a brilliant smile, and in that moment, I would have done anything for her. Much better, dumbass, she giggled. She didn't seem bothered by a stranger approaching her. I suppose when you look like her, it probably happens all the time. I introduced myself, told her she was beautiful, and asked her out for a date on the following Friday. If I say yes, will you wipe the drool off your chin? She asked coyly. What? Yes, drool, drool, drool. Of course, it disappeared right away, I replied. 
Well, I can definitely see you're not one of those smooth talkers with a line for everything, so sure, we can go out on Friday night. I got her phone number. That Friday night, we dined at a cozy Italian restaurant in Ames. As I sat there, completely enamored, she effortlessly recounted her life story from age three to the present. I think she only paused because our main course had arrived. We just clicked. Within a month, we spent almost all our free time together. She wasn't just intelligent, she was her high school's valedictorian, but she had a mischievous sense of humor and a quiet confidence. I considered myself decent looking, nothing extraordinary, but I was fairly athletic, earned seven varsity letters in high school, intelligent, ranked in the top five of my high school, and could hold my own in conversations on a wide range of topics. Though, as Diana pointed out, I wasn't the smooth-talking type, I had confidence in myself. Still, I knew I was punching above my weight when I asked her out. But hey, you never know if you don't try, right? Diana and I tied the knot soon after graduation. We both found jobs easily, she as a third grade teacher and me as an accountant. With solid incomes, we bought a house a couple of years later, and almost exactly a year after moving in, we welcomed our daughter into the world. Life was good. Our intimate life, while not overly adventurous, was fulfilling and frequent enough for both of us, though like many couples, time and age did impact its frequency. Still, even after Deborah left for college, we were still active three or four times a week. Through the years, I had moments where I worried about Diana being faithful, but they were rare. Occasionally, she'd mention one of the new young teachers at her school being a bit flirty, but she never gave me any reason to believe she reciprocated or that anything progressed further. So, I always chalked it up to my own paranoia. I mean, I'm not blind. My wife is still attractive, and I couldn't fault any man for giving her a second glance, just a glance. Sharing isn't part of my vocabulary. I made that clear to Diana when we first became exclusive. She echoed the sentiment, saying she felt the same way. She didn't mind if I looked at other women, but any form of touching would be unacceptable. I was more than fine with that. And that was how things were until three years ago. We were at the annual summer party, hosted by our neighbors three doors down in our trendy neighborhood. James and Viola Sanders threw a fantastic all-day bash at their place every year, the weekend after the 4th of July. Diana and I never missed it, and neither did most of our neighbors. James and Viola were superb hosts. The food and drinks were top-notch. They had a large in-ground pool and a sand volleyball court. Even the guests they invited from outside the neighborhood were good people. Except for one, but I'll get to that. The party kicked off at noon and Diana and I strolled in around one. I headed to the bar, grabbed a white Zinfandel for Diana and a Michelob for myself, and we began mingling, first together, then separately as we got caught up in various conversations both inside and outside the house. It had never been an issue before. Every now and then, I'd check in with Diana to see if she needed a refill or some snacks, and sometimes she'd find me. We usually exchanged a quick peck on the lips before parting ways. I was chatting with a group of male neighbors while Diane was across the yard, engaged in conversation with a group of women, when a small group of outsiders arrived. It was a man with two women, and James went up to greet them. That's when I saw the thunderbolt hit Diana. As I glanced at the newcomers, I happened to look over at Diana, who had stopped talking to her friends and was staring at the newcomers with a look on her face that I can now describe as a mix of amazement and pure desire. At the time, I didn't fully comprehend the look, only that she seemed mesmerized, and I have to admit my spider senses started tingling. She watched them for about 10 seconds before turning in my direction, meeting my eyes, and blushing a deep red. Then, she turned back to her friends and rejoined the conversation. Have you ever had one of those moments where you just feel like something isn't quite right, but you can't quite put your finger on it? That's the feeling I got about an hour later, and it didn't help when I scanned the yard and couldn't find Diana. I grabbed a white wine for her from the bar and started to wander around. Finally, I found her in the Sanders' den with four other people, including the guy she had been staring at earlier. In fact, he had his arm casually draped around my wife's back, his hand resting on her right hip. It seemed a bit too cozy for my liking, especially considering she had just met this guy, 
and the five of them appeared to be engaged in friendly conversation. I trust myself and completely trust my wife, and I didn't want to make a scene, but I felt this was crossing a line for the newcomer. I approached the group from behind Diana and her new friend, and I firmly gripped his wrist to remove it from her hip. I don't think we've met yet, despite the fact that you seem a bit too comfortable with my wife, I said, my voice carrying a hard edge. He tried to pull away, but my grip on his wrist kept him in place. Diana, who had seemed flushed before I approached, turned even redder when she realized I was right there. Oh, Jerry, please. She sort of squealed as she realized I was squeezing his wrist. Jerry, this is Andrew Balzac. He teaches European literature at the college. He's French, and he wasn't doing anything inappropriate, so I just let his hand stay where it was. The others in the group nodded in agreement, so I released Andrew's wrist and shook his hand firmly, applying a bit too much pressure and unintentionally squeezing a few of his middle hand bones together. Diana then introduced me to the rest of the group, almost as an afterthought. Thought you might need a refill, I said to her as I handed her the wine glass, keeping my eyes fixed on Andrew. You're so considerate, my dear husband, she replied. Andrew struck me as typical Euro trash. I couldn't help but notice he was a pretty good-looking guy of 32, slightly above average height, with a three-day beard and hair that was somewhere between long and needing a trim. He spoke with a full French accent in English, and I couldn't shake the feeling that he was probably involved with half of his students, both the female and male ones. After the introductions, he resumed discussing Victor Hugo or someone else, and feeling satisfied that I had asserted myself, I wandered back outside to the yard. Diana and Andra made their way to the backyard for the start of the sand volleyball game. I was always heavily involved in these matches, and as we played on the winner's court, my team was frequently on the court. We always attracted a decent crowd watching from the safety of the deck, where my wife settled, with Andra right next to her. I was too focused on the game to pay much attention to them, but I did notice plenty of hand and arm touching, smiling, and the occasional blush from my wife. Every so often, I'd wave over to her, and she'd wave back. My team had been winning games for a while, and after an hour, I noticed that Diana and Andre were no longer in their seats. I scanned the bar and the grill area but didn't see them. My intuition was screaming, so I convinced one of the other guys to take my place, jokingly blaming my tired 47-year-old legs and claiming I needed a beer urgently. I endured some good-natured teasing about being an old man as I left the sand court. To keep up appearances, I headed to the bar and grabbed another beer, then wandered around the yard aimlessly before deciding to check inside the house. I went through every open room and listened intently at the closed doors, but there was no sign of Diana or Andra. Finally, I approached the hostess, Viola, and casually asked if she had seen my wife recently. Yeah, she and Andrew went out to his car to check something, I think, Viola replied casually. What kind of car does he drive? I asked, my tone a bit tense. Viola's expression suddenly shifted. We've been friends and neighbors for over 15 years, and concern crossed her face as she answered, a gray sob. I stepped outside and looked down the street, but there was no sign of a sob. Viola joined me in the driveway. I'm sure it's nothing, Jerry, she said soothingly. They probably just went to the college for a moment. Yeah, thanks. Probably nothing, I muttered, lacking conviction, and walked off. The local college was only five minutes away. I decided to check it out myself. I drove over and searched through every parking lot they had. No sob. I dialed Diana's cell, but it went straight to voicemail, indicating she was either busy or her phone was off. I left a message. Over the next hour, I left four more messages as I sat in my house. I also called her parents and her sister, asking if they had heard from her today. They all said no. The old Sherlock Holmes quote came to mind. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. I settled into my lazy boy in the family room and stared at the blank big screen for hours. I didn't need to turn on the TV to see images because in my mind's eye, I saw my wife cheating on me with that French bastard. Why did we bother saving this country in two world wars? Should have let the Germans keep it.
I didn't sleep a wink all night as I sat in the chair, staring at the TV. I half expected Diana to sneak into the house in the middle of the night, but when that didn't happen, I began to worry that Andrew might have been in a car wreck with Diana. At about 8 a.m., I called the local sheriff's office, identified myself, and asked if there had been any wrecks during the night. They said there weren't. I called Diana's phone another four times and got nothing each time. As noon approached, I heard a car pull into the driveway, and I could tell it was just one person from the sound of a single door slamming. About 45 seconds later, Diana unlocked the door, stepped inside, and quietly made her way to the sofa on the opposite side of the family room where I was sitting. Any lingering doubts about what they were up to were quickly dispelled by her appearance. At least she had the decency to shower before coming home. Her long blonde hair, which had been loose yesterday, was now pulled back into a damp ponytail, and she wore no makeup. She was still in the yellow sundress from yesterday, and her chest, shoulders, and arms were tinged pink from the sun. Despite the situation, I had to admit she looked good. But what struck me more was her lack of remorse or guilt. Instead, she seemed to wear a condescending smirk. Nice of you to show up. Did you have a good time last night and this morning? I sneered. Actually, I did, she replied smugly. That wasn't the response I was expecting. Look, Jerry, she continued calmly. Have you ever in your life felt an incredible physical and emotional connection with someone from the moment you saw them? I mean, completely amazing, almost electric, and wonderful, and amazing. Yes, I have, I answered immediately. I married that woman. That wasn't the response she expected. Her usually calm demeanor shattered, her eyes revealing a hint of recognition of my despair. I met someone yesterday. I can't explain it. I have to be with him. I love him, she said. Just like that? Aren't you out of your mind? I shouted. You're willing to throw away 25 years of marriage because of a feeling that I mean nothing to you. I'm not sure why she was surprised by my outburst. She started sobbing uncontrollably. I didn't care. I do love you, Jerry, she finally choked out. What we've shared has been wonderful, but this connection with him is unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love you, but I'm in love with him. It's incredible. Incredible, I understand. Give me some time to digest this, and maybe I'll throw you a party, I said sarcastically. So, should we start filing for divorce, or do you want to? I asked, either way, it will be an equal split, and we'll sell the house and divide the money. I don't think we need to rush into divorce just yet, she said with a hint of exasperation. Let's see how things unfold. We can make big decisions later. Now it was my turn to feel exasperated. What? I protested. That's not going to fly. You can't just keep me on standby. If you're involved with him, you can have him as soon as possible. As far as I'm concerned, we were finished as of yesterday when you first did it. The fact that you've repeated it with him several times since then only strengthens my resolve. But, 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 she stammered. Fine then, I'll file for divorce, and I'll be out by the end of the week. True to my word, by the end of the week, I had my belongings out of the house. I took a couple of personal days off from work and got it done. While I was loading up my pickup one evening, James and Viola Sanders came down the block and apologized to me for inviting Andrew to their party. I stopped them politely, pointing out that they couldn't have known Diana would act like this with him. Still, we can't help but feel responsible, Viola said, looking at their shoes. My lawyer had divorce papers drawn up, and Diana was served within a month. Apparently, she thought I would drag my feet, because my lawyer told me the process server said she had a fit when he handed her the papers. Which explains why two days later she showed up at my new apartment and barged right in when I answered the door to her ringing the bell. How could you do this if you love me as much as you say you do? She railed as she walked into my apartment. I was shocked at first, but quickly recovered as anger took over. Are you serious? I yelled back. You're with another man. What did you expect me to do? I may love you, but I'm not going to be your willing cuckold. If this doesn't work out, what am I supposed to do then? Just give me a little time. If it doesn't work out, I'll come back to you and be the best wife ever. We can grow old together, she pleaded. 
You're delusional, I retorted. I'm not letting you run off with the man of your dreams until you're sure it's right. Besides, if he's your dream guy, why wouldn't it work out? Andrew is in the process of divorcing his wife, and they have some financial issues to sort out. So, in other words, he may be Mr. Right for you, but you might not be his Mrs. Right. I interjected. More sputtering followed before I finally demanded she get her cheating self out of my apartment or I would throw her out myself. Diana and her attorney did everything they could to slow down the divorce process. Meanwhile, Mr. Wonderful moved into my old house and took my place. Four months later, I was leaving Shays Michaels with a colleague after a business dinner when I saw a familiar face, actually two faces, heading towards the door. It was Andrew and a visibly pregnant Diana. She appeared to be about three months along. I stopped in my tracks, gawking, blocking their entrance into the restaurant. Oh my god, I muttered half under my breath. My colleague had stopped alongside me, looking thoroughly confused as the four of us stood face to face. Martin, I'd like you to meet my wife, at least for a few more months, and her lover, Andrew Balzac, I introduced them awkwardly. Martin found himself in the unenviable position of having to maintain politeness in an extremely uncomfortable situation. I thought he handled himself well. She's pregnant. Is that yours? He asked after a few seconds of silence. That is most definitely his, I replied brightly. You're an asshole, Jerry. You know that, was all she said as she and Andre stepped past us and into the restaurant. I later found out from Viola Sanders that Diana was indeed three months along. Apparently, Andrew was such a wonderful man that Diana wanted to have his child and went off birth control. Good luck with that, was all I said to Viola. The divorce was finalized several months later, and two months after that, Diana brought a son into the world. Of course, they named him Andrew Jr., because when you're so wonderful, what better way to tell the world than by naming another human being after yourself? Our daughter Deborah wasn't exactly thrilled about Diana's decision to have another child at this point in life, especially since her parents weren't together and I wasn't the father. I'll admit I was proud of my daughter for taking my side in this mess. While I knew she had the baby, I hadn't talked to Diana or seen her since running into her at the restaurant all those months ago. I suppose I knew it would happen eventually since we both lived in town, but I have to admit I was more than a little surprised the first time I saw Diana after she had given birth. The extra weight gain didn't look good on her, and it seemed like the whole experience had been tough on her now 49-year-old body. I almost walked right past the somewhat grandmotherly woman pushing the stroller with what looked to be a one-year-old boy in it in the mall in town. Jerry, come on, there's no need to be so rude, a familiar voice chastised me as I hurried past the pair one Saturday afternoon. I stopped abruptly, recognizing the voice, and despite my efforts not to, I did a slow double take at the woman and the baby. Oh no, it was Diana and her son. Hey, stranger, I greeted, trying to collect myself. Hey yourself, she replied. The baby was undeniably beautiful, inheriting Diana's hair and eye color, but with a slightly darker complexion like his father's. Wow, mom, he's beautiful, I remarked sincerely. Diana blushed lightly and thanked me. I haven't seen you in a while, and well, pushing a stroller, I apologized for not recognizing her immediately. Although she visibly flinched at my apology, she let it pass without comment. Despite finding her incredibly attractive after Deborah's birth many years ago, she was over 20 years older now, and with this baby not being mine, I suppose my hormones were in check. We chatted amicably for a few more minutes, mostly about her struggles with sleep, and I detected a note of genuine sadness, something she never displayed after Deborah's birth. I finally excused myself and continued shopping for what I had come for. The next time I saw Diana was at the Sanders' summer party about six months later. James and Viola had always felt guilty that it was at their party where Diana met Andrew, but I assured them then, as I do now, that I didn't blame them for Diana's poor decision. Nevertheless, Viola kept trying to set me up with her single and divorced friends, and I must admit, some of those setups were pretty good. They kept inviting me back to the annual summer party, and after missing the last two, I decided to attend again. 
even though they warned me that Diana and Andrew would be there. I assured them that if any issues arose, I wouldn't be the cause, and I meant it. I had been at the party for a couple of hours when I spotted Diana and Andrew entering the backyard. Since their baby wasn't with them, I assumed they had left the child with a sitter. Diana had shed some of her pregnancy weight and didn't appear as matronly as she did the last time I saw her, but there was an unmistakable sadness in her once bright blue eyes. Even when she smiled, there was a certain emptiness in her gaze. I decided to address the elephant in the room early, so I approached Diana and Andrew, giving Diana a gentle hug and shaking Andrew's hand. I could tell they were both a bit surprised, and I noticed Viola holding her breath as I approached them. After a brief exchange of pleasantries, I excused myself and rejoined my friends by the grill. When the sand volleyball game started, I joined one of the teams. My team played the second game, and while I was on the sand, I noticed Diana sitting in a chair, watching and cheering. Mr. Wonderful was nowhere to be seen. We played two games, losing the second, so we had to leave the court and wait for our next turn. As I went to get a beer, I glanced over at Diana, sitting alone. Old habits die hard, I thought, grabbing my drink and heading inside. I checked the third room, the den, and my suspicions were confirmed. Andrew had his arm around Marion Adams' waist, chatting in a small group, while Marion looked at him with unmistakable desire. Marion, a former neighbor from down the street, was definitely married. I should have kept to myself, I mused. If I keep quiet, Andrew might end up cheating on Diana. But if I speak up, I'll face trouble either way. A true friend would intervene, but I was merely her ex-husband. Why was it my responsibility? Then fate intervened. Marion's husband, Travis, was on my sand volleyball team and apparently had followed me inside. He saw the same scene, Andrew with his arm around his wife and Marion gazing at him like he was irresistible. You son of a bitch, get your hands off my wife, you bastard. Travis screamed at Andrew as he lunged toward the pair. I started to move to intervene, but then common sense prevailed and I let my volleyball teammate rush past me. Before Andrew could pull away, Travis grabbed his arm, twisting it sharply. There was a distinct crack, followed by Andrew's howl of pain. The room quickly filled with more people as they came to see what the commotion was about. Luckily, one of Viola's friends was an emergency room nurse. She took one look at Andrew's arm and called for an ambulance. They arrived about 10 minutes later with two police officers. The officers took statements from everyone present in case Andrew decided to press charges against Travis Adams. The senior officer, Eschen, Will Ross, appeared to be around my age. The junior officer, Officer Grace McBride, looked about 40, with freckles, green eyes, and long orange hair. I made sure to go over to Officer McBride's side of the room to give my statement. In the midst of this chaos was Diana crying and holding onto Andrew's good arm, trying to comfort him while the EMTs worked. She clearly had no idea what had happened. When the EMTs stabilized Andrew, they put him in the ambulance, but told Diana she would have to make her own way to the hospital. She looked at me with a lost expression, so I nodded and pointed to Officer McBride, then held up five fingers. McBride saw Diana waiting for me, so she questioned me next. I gave her my perspective on what had happened including the fact that Andrew had stolen my wife at a party three years ago. She looked surprised at my revelation. And you're still going to take her to the hospital to be with him, she asked. Are you just that nice of a guy or a complete idiot? I have to admit, I didn't see that one coming. Looking up at her, I saw she was trying to stifle a smile. Complete idiot, I replied. She seemed caught off guard by my response and let out a small chuckle. I found myself enjoying the sound. After a couple more questions, I finished giving my statement. She told me I could take Diana to the hospital, but before I left, she warned me that Diana probably wouldn't believe my story. Don't expect her to, I replied. As I started to turn away, she began moving to the next person for a statement. But a quick thought crossed my mind, and I blurted it out. Maybe you should give me your card in case I remember something else officer. She grinned back at me, her eyes practically sparkling. 
Taking a card from the top left pocket of her uniform shirt, she flipped it over and wrote what I assumed was her personal phone number. Thank you, officer. I chuckled back at her, then put on my serious face and turned toward Diana. Let's go. On the way to the hospital, Diana asked me what had happened to Andrew. I told her the truth, but I wasn't surprised when she didn't believe me. Can't you just move on, Jerry? She whined. It's been three years. It's not about moving on, Trace, I replied. Andrew shouldn't have laid his hands on Marion Adams, and Travis did the right thing. Maybe if I had been as bold, you and I would still be together. I hadn't expected those words to come out. Tears welled in Diana's eyes as she turned away from me in the pickup. I dropped Diana off at the emergency room and didn't go in with her. She'd have to get an Uber back to the small home she and Andrew shared since we sold our house and split the proceeds after the divorce. With her gone for the night, I reached into my shirt pocket for the card officer Grace McBride had given me earlier. A lovely woman, I thought to myself. I tried to play it cool, so I waited three days before calling Officer Grace McBride. She answered on the second ring. Could you have waited any longer? I could have gotten engaged and married by now, she teased over the phone. I suppose you're right, but if you move that fast, then you're never going to be the next and final Mrs. Gerald Bennett, I replied. Now who's being cheeky, she countered. How do you know I'll even say yes when you ask me out? And no, I don't want to go to any freaking Irish pub on a date. Her Irish pub comment caught me off guard because honestly, that's what I had in mind. It just seemed like the thing to do, taking an Irish girl to an Irish pub. She picked up on my hesitation and knew she had guessed right. What the hell is with you guys? Don't any of you have any creativity? You see flaming red hair and right away you all think Irish pub. I stuttered for a split second before I came up with my plan B. We had a top-notch Greek restaurant in the city that I absolutely loved, and Greek food is quite a step away from Irish. She thought for about a nanosecond before responding positively. Thanks for being a little creative on the rebound, she said. Once I turned down the Irish pub, most guys immediately go to Asian. I'm sorry, but I'm not a big fan of food that looks like it could be a haven for cockroaches. I guffawed out loud at that one, and I think that's when I knew I might have found someone to grow old with. We talked for another hour, about everything and nothing. I found out she was actually 45 and had been divorced for 10 years. Seems her ex also had a problem with fidelity. She had a son who was a Michigan State sophomore, majoring in pre-law. Saturday night's dinner was exquisite, and the company was simply delightful. I arrived at her house on the south side of town and was truly mesmerized by how stunning she looked in her little black dress and towering four-inch heels. She had curves in all the right places, gorgeous legs, a lovely face, and that striking red hair. She was the epitome of beauty. Our conversation meandered through various topics, captivating me completely. Her voice was like music to my ears, and I could have listened to her all night long. Neither of us seemed to be in a rush to settle down, which made her both relaxed and intriguing. She possessed a natural curiosity, almost like that of a detective, asking probing questions and carefully considering my responses. After dinner, I drove her back home. I didn't extend an invitation to my place, and she didn't invite me in either when we reached her doorstep. We exchanged good nights, and then she surprised me by leaning in for a soft kiss on the cheek. I felt my face flush with embarrassment as I bid her good night and floated back to my car. It was like being 16 all over again. Her lips were soft against my cheek, and I caught a hint of white shoulders perfume lingering in the air. She called me Sunday morning, inviting me over for bagels and locks at her place. How could I resist such an offer? A few days later, Viola and James asked me to dinner, partly to apologize for recent events and partly to hear my side of the story. Apparently, Andrew was threatening legal action against them and Travis Adams. This guy must think he's God's gift to women. James exclaimed at one point. He is rather handsome and charming, I must admit, Viola said, earning a glare from James. According to the Sanderses, Travis spent the weekend in jail, before being bailed out on Monday morning. When he returned home, Marion and their kids were gone, staying with her mother in another town. 
James speculated that their 12-year marriage was likely over. Well, give Travis my number and let him know that I understand what he's going through. I'll be there for him if he needs someone to talk to. And I'll back him up when this ends up in court, I offered. We'll pass on the message, and I'm sure he'll appreciate it, James replied. By the way, this was the last summer fling we're hosting. I can't handle this kind of pressure. Viola seemed preoccupied with her plate as James spoke. It seemed that things weren't going so well in Sandersland since the party. A few months later, when 47-year-old Viola began to visibly show a baby bump in public, my suspicions were confirmed. I didn't need to guess who the father might be, because James himself called me to break the news. Can you believe this? He practically screamed into the phone when I answered. That jerk got my wife pregnant. She's been seeing him since last year's party. According to James, he hadn't suspected a thing until Viola started getting morning sickness. It was the same pattern she had when she was pregnant with her two children years ago. When James confronted her, she admitted to having an affair with Andrew for over a year, although most of the time they used protection. However, during a weekend getaway at a motel, they ran out and decided to take the risk without it. After learning all this, James asked for the name of my attorney. Can I at least get a friends and family discount? He joked bitterly. Andra and Viola had apparently moved into an apartment near the campus, leaving Diana and her son to fend for themselves, James informed me. Not my problem, I replied. But then I underestimated the complexity of the female mind. I was having lunch at a nearby McDonald's when she approached my table, holding her son's hand. She placed her tray of food on the table across from me, and the child eagerly sat beside me. Hey, Diana. Hi, Andrew Jr. I greeted them as I approached. The child, now around three years old, extended a clean hand for a handshake. Impressed by his attempt at maturity, I took his little hand in mine and shook it firmly. Hello, sir, he said in his most grown-up voice. Hello, Jerry, Diana added. He's really growing, I remarked, looking at her son. You might have a six-footer on your hand someday. Diana seemed to appreciate my attempt at civility, but her troubled expression hinted at something deeper. Ask me already, I encouraged her gently, observing her son unwrap a cheeseburger. Did you ever really love me as much as you said you did? She began softly. Because if you did, then how come you didn't fight for me, like Travis did for Marion? How come you never asked me to come back, like someone who truly loved me would have? How come you haven't stopped by my house to see how me and my son are doing and maybe invite us over for an evening? I hadn't seen that coming at all. Suddenly, was this my fault? I took in a deep breath, trying to remain calm and avoid an angry outburst. So this whole thing is on me. Seriously, you're the wronged innocent party here. My voice started to rise as I spoke. This wasn't what I wanted. I needed to make my point without escalating. Do you remember when I removed Andrew's hand from your waist and you insisted there was nothing going on, urging me not to cause trouble? I trusted you completely, so I didn't push further. I trusted your word. Forgive me for that. If I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't have trusted you. I would have confronted him, like Travis did. But you, the person I trusted the most, lied to me, so I didn't fight for you. When you came home the next day at noon, what could I say? The deed had already been done, many times by the looks of you. So, what was left to fight about at that point? You had given yourself to another man and broken our vows. There wasn't anything left for me to fight for. You made it abundantly clear. This was your decision alone, and I had no say in it. So what was left? You were no longer mine. You were his. But you never even tried to change my mind, she whined, or make me stay. Nothing. If you really loved me. How many times did you sleep with Andrew that first night? And morning? I'll bet it was several, I said. Once was a terrible mistake, but maybe I could have taken you back. Twice was already a conscious choice. More than that was you breaking my heart and stomping it to pieces. And you had the audacity to tell me you had a fantastic time, incredible time, if memory serves me right, and that you and he had this almost otherworldly connection. You didn't regret a thing. You know, lust and slut are made of the same four letters, so what was I supposed to do? 
As the saying goes, if you love something, let it go. If it comes back, it's yours. If not, it never was. And then, just to add insult to injury, you have his kid at 48. I couldn't get you to agree to a second child in 25 years, but not only do you easily give yourself to Mr. Wonderful, but then you let him impregnate you. So this is about your bruised male ego. She said perhaps a bit too snappily for my taste. My head shot up at that, but with our child sitting at the table with us, I didn't take the bait. No, what you did once you were his was your choice. You apparently loved him enough to want to have his baby, even if you never wanted another with me. Trust me, I got the message. We ate in silence for a few minutes. She looked hesitant. I knew where this was going, but someone had to address it. So now what's your plan? I finally asked. You and Aunt are never married, but he is listed as the child's father, right? At the very least, you should go after him for child support. I'm going to let Viola have him, Diana said. But you're right, I should get child support from that cheating jerk. That's good advice. Do you ever think about us, sometimes? She added. How it would have been. Honestly, no, I responded quietly. You broke my heart so completely that I never wanted to ponder what might have been. I have some wonderful memories of our past life that I will cherish forever. But that's in the past, and it's not coming back. We resumed eating. I watched the boy play with his French fries, recalling a time when our daughter Deborah did the same thing. He's a good kid. I'm glad something positive came out of that relationship. You know, even though we started with a strong connection, ultimately we never really bonded the way you and I did. It began with passion, I won't deny, but it never evolved into a true partnership. Love never replaced lust once the spark faded. And that's when it seemed to dawn on her, that moment of realization. She shook her head sadly, tears forming in the corners of her eyes. She traded the warmth and security of love for the lightning strike of lust, and like true lightning, it had its moment of brilliance before vanishing. Epilogue My wife and I just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary with a trip to Spain. At first I suggested to her a celebratory trip to her homeland, but she resisted and in the end we decided to go to a sunny and positive country. We have a few more years of work to do before we retire from the computer security firm we started together a few years ago. We've done quite well since I retired from engineering and she retired from the police force to start the company. We are together almost constantly, both professionally and personally, and yet it never gets boring. I know it sounds corny, but I think I love her more every day. Between us, we now have five grandchildren from our two kids. Despite one family living in Denver CO and the other in Houston TX, we manage to see the grandkids regularly. I occasionally bump into Diana around town, but our conversations are brief. She's busy being a working mom to her 13-year-old son. My daughter, who occasionally talks to her mother, tells me Diana hasn't remarried and rarely dates. Apparently, her ex had to be dragged into jail before consistently paying child support. It sounds like a tough life without many luxuries, but we all make our choices and live with them. I won't apologize for moving forward with my life. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.